What's up? What's up? Another go round is official. Thanks. Got a uh, Essex County all day edition here. Got a legendary coach, Chet Paulovecchio. Done been many places in regards to coaching, but even as an athlete, great, great athlete. Spent some time in the pros, what have you there. Educator, father, grandfather, et cetera here. Legendary when we're talking about Essex County. Just recently elected to the Essex County Coaches Hall of Fame, one of his many accolades here. So, like I said, I'm just really, really just uh, humbled just by, you know, not only him, but everyone else just willing to share some time, just talk about themselves or what have you there. Just, you know, just taking a trip down memory lane, but also what people are doing currently here. So, let's just hold tight and I'll get them on. There we go. We're in. <laughs> Even, I hate the year 2021. Yeah. I'm a 1960s guy. <laughs> I know you told me you told me you had the flip phone still. So absolutely. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Coach, for jumping on. Jay, oh, I'm joy. Thank you. Now, uh, um, as I mentioned when we spoke, like I said, this is just something little I just started doing in regards to my own media family, what have you. And like I mentioned, I had a, I had a sports family. And like I said, just very just. Uh, we talk about this county, like. You know, it's near and dear to my heart just growing up, you know, in Orange School in Montclair, sure. but playing sports all over the place in every, pretty much every town in Essex County there. So, and also just being a sports fan, I think just one of those things as far as just from Star Ledges to Orange Transcripts to Montclair, whatever, you can just name it. Just kind of just want to know what's going on with everybody else and how everybody's doing, whether it was coaches such as yourself or the athletes as well, too. So, you know, well, so I was like, let me just reach out to people that, you know, that I know of, admiration of, just kind of just take a trip down memory lane, bring it up to the present time and talk about whatever we want to talk about. So that's the gist of this. And I call it official thanks. So I kind of tied a little sports thing with the official thing, but they basically just saying thank you to everybody as well. well I'm, I'm a, I'm a Nessus County guy. I was born and raised in Irvington. Mm -hmm. um, like I told you before, I was a camper. Back then they weren't the blue Knights. We were campers. Wow. wow. Um, I still to this day have no idea what a camper was, but that's either here nor there. <laughs> but I go back a long, long time to the days of the Irvington PAL Colts, and uh, mm -hmm. I loved it. I loved growing up in Irvington. I loved the town of Irvington. I went to Myrtle Avenue High School. Matt, yeah, I mean, I, I, my heart got broken, but not too long ago, we were playing Irvington at Passaic Valley. We took a ride. You know, we were going down to Irvington, mm -hmm. and I drove by Madison Avenue School, and it was gone. Yeah. And my heart broke. That's where mm -hmm. I went to grammar school. Wow. And it was just a lot. And I guess, you know, like everything in this world today, they're going to build condos. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But it was gone. And I, and I we get to the school and we pull in and they tell us, boys, go to this locker over here. And I walk in and one of my players says to me, coach, what's wrong with you? I said, you wouldn't believe this if I told you. Mm -hmm. I said, you see this locker you're sitting in? I was nine years old the first time I sat in this very locker mm -hmm. with a uniform on. Yeah. And he went, oh, my God. I said, yeah. I said, it kind of hit me for a moment. You know, mm -hmm. those those things get you. And, you know, it, it was home. It was home. No, absolutely. And, and that's the human side sometimes players need to see. I mean, you know, as far as in coaches, you know, you guys are human and have emotions, different emotions, not necessarily the coaches' emotions, but you can kind of, you know, sulk and take things in as well, too. That's pretty – where in Irvington – um, did you go out with street? We were neighbor. I live on Vermont Avenue. Vermont. Went okay. to Myrtle Avenue, went mm -hmm. to Myrtle Avenue Junior High. And then from there, my family, we moved. Okay. I went to Seton Hall Prep. Um, but mm -hmm. most of the guys that I played with on the Colts went to Irvington High, finished their careers at Irvington High School. Mm -hmm. And um, so for me, many years later, to go back as their head coach, it was really something. It, it really, there was a, there was a, a, a sense of home when I went yeah. back and I, I loved it. And, you know, I, I saw some old faces that I still knew back then in those days. And, you know, like I said, it, it was just a very great, it, it was a great stay. And I say to this people all the time, if I didn't go to Temple University to coach, I'd probably still be at Irvington today. I had no intention yeah. of going anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I had great kids. Uh, the school was hundred percent behind us. Um, Saturday afternoon was great back there. And, uh, you know, I, again, I used to play touch football while the high school game was on Yeah. You know, yeah. when I was a kid back in that corner over there. Mm -hmm. And um, 
We used to call it Dookie Alley because dogs used to poop in the back. <laughs> so my lineman would have to go down there to drill. And they said, oh, coach, not there again. I said, gosh, got nowhere else to go. <laughs> yeah, what we're going to do is, yeah, that's, yeah. Now, it was a great time. No, nah, good, good. And just to, like, a step back, as far as even as a child, like, was football your first joy as far as sports or were there other sports that you gravitated as well to? Well, you know, in Irvington, one thing we had growing up in Irvington, we had great everything, Ibn. Okay. We had a great Little League. Do you remember Little League Field right off of the parkway? Right that off the thing parkway, was yes. to catch me out. That thing was like a minor league. You know, you, we look at all these minor league parks being brought up today. And back in the day, Little League Field was gorgeous. It had the big stands and the good food thing. And the field was manicured. Then we had Parkway Park. We had Orange Park. We had Irvington Park. We would field, we must have had three levels, minor league, major league. Um, then we had basketball at every junior high. We had basketball leagues. And mm -hmm. then obviously the Irvington PAL Colts, which was an enigma. Irvington yeah. PAL Colts will never be seen again. It was, um, it, it was an incredible organization. It was incredible what the kids uh, achieved in it. Um, I, to this day, in all the years gone by, I've never seen a Pop Warner run like the Irvington Pale culture. I mean, let's be honest, I'm 12 years old and we're playing for the national championship. You know, yeah. we're playing, yeah, I mean, we're playing where um, Steinbrenner Stadium down in Miami where the Yankees had training camp, ourselves, the Miami Barracudas, who was the host team, and the New mm -hmm. Orleans Fighting Saints. Even these guys chartered in. They came in their own play. Wow. Playing. That is Pop Warner. Mm -hmm. They come on the field. They got the New Orleans Saint uniforms. They got the capes with the big New Orleans Saint sign on it. Coaches had headsets. This is Pop Warner. Archie and, Man is sponsored them or something? Oh, I don't know. No, Burger King. Burger King. We okay. found out later they were the Burger King New Orleans Fighting Saints. Okay. And they were an all-star team from Louisiana. And we mm -hmm. went down there. We got invited. And it was a round robin. And we beat Miami. We went down there. We beat Miami. And then... Obviously, New Orleans beat Miami, and then we played New Orleans for the championship, and mm -hmm. it was an unbelievable game. We fumbled on the three-yard line going oh, in for the win, yeah. and we had them on their heels, man. They didn't see that coming. They never – believe me, they didn't a million years think these kids from Irvington were going to come and do that to them. And uh, it, was, it was a great experience, and we flew back home, and, you know, like I said, the lead continued, and then somewhere I lost touch – when I moved out of Irvington with what had happened with the Colts. Mm -hmm. But my dear friend, Ralph Steele, who's still in Irvington today, he runs the Blue Knights. He runs the, okay. the Pop Warner now. Mm -hmm. And they do a fabulous job. Ralph was a great feeder program to me. Um, his son's the head wrestling coach there, does a great job. Um, so the Steele family is still very much involved in Irvington. They do a fabulous job. No, nah, nah, that, that's good stuff. And to be 12, the, back then to go down to Florida, I mean, yeah. That sticks with you to this day. That's if we played day. not only there, I mean, this now think about this. Here you are, Pop Warner kids. We played in Convention Hall in Atlantic City against the Pittsburgh Steelers, team from Pittsburgh. Now they use that as a football field, the oh, convention. Yeah. We went okay. oh, back then, the old convention hall, they had grass right in there. And it was sharp. It was pretty sharp. There was a they would have a jamboree there. There was four teams invited, or okay. eight teams, four games. We wound up drawing the Pittsburgh Steelers because, again, we were nationally ranked. We wound up going to Raleigh, North Carolina. We played North Carolina All-Stars. Mm -hmm. We went to Hazelden, Pennsylvania, played the Pennsylvania All-Stars. Coming to us, coming to Irvington, was the, um, the Philadelphia Quakers came okay. to us, and the team from Omaha, Nebraska mm. came to us. Yeah. And in those days, how we did it was – they stood with us. We would meet their bus or their plane, okay. and each one of us would take a kid for the weekend. And they would stay with us, and then at the end of the weekend, they would win, lose, or draw, you know, you're going home. But it, Irby, it was an incredible organization. They did oh, a great oh, job. It sounded like it. It sounded like it. And I know you mentioned Seton Hall. Like, was that the only place you were going to go to high school? Were there other choices that you would No, that's to... a great question. No, my brother had gone to Seton Hall. Okay. Coach Verducci was a legend. You know what I mean? Right. Um, you know, I, I always wanted to play for Coach Verducci growing up. My brother did two years earlier before me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was some pressure to Irvington High, but it was funny. You know, and this were it was sad in a way because the three better players on, like, for instance, that one team all went to Seton Hall. And mm -hmm. back then there was another school, Our Lady of the Valley, if you remember. Right. 
Right. And a couple guys went there. Um, but I went to Seattle because I moved. I moved okay. to West Orange, so I moved. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to play for a legend. He was, you know, and, and again, the career, you know, what went on afterwards is mythical for what high school football is about. I mean, he was just a great, great man to play for. And there was another great man there I played for, and a guy named Sam Fortunato, who wound up being the mm -hmm. principal at Union High School. He yeah. was one of the, he received national recognition for what he did at Union as far as uh, uh, SAT scores and what he had accomplished at that school. He was the last cut of the Dallas Cowboys when he played from the University of Maryland, mm -hmm. and he was a great influence on me also. So between Sam Fortunata and Coach Verducci, uh, it was tough to lose football games. Oh, no, absolutely. Now, back then, even at Seton Hall, was it a rule that you couldn't play varsity at a certain point, or you uh, you went right in and started playing right away? It was away? hard. I mean, it was hard to, to make varsity. See, here's the thing that I, people – this was the transition time, Ib. This was the time – when, if you remember back in the, in the, in the early seventies or mid seventies, it for a public school to lose to a parochial, it was an embarrassment. See, we all see it now because we see the way around. The way around. Yeah. It wasn't that way back mm -hmm. then. If I remember we'd open with Bloomfield. Now Bloomfield mm -hmm. was a powerhouse back in those days and we beat them two years in a row. And my buddy, one of my assistant coaches, Lou Paradiso, He's he he's um he was the quarterback at Bloomfield in those days. And he said to me, he says, Chet, that was mortifying to us, you know, to lose to a parochial. Yeah. But the bottom line is that was the beginning of us winning 40 in a row. So yeah, nobody yeah, beat yeah. us for a long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that was the trick, that was the moment that the parochial started to make that move where they had the superior talent and they were recruiting, not recruit, because back then they weren't recruiting. Kids mm -hmm. wanted to go there. They wanted to go, yeah. And that's when the separation started. But prior to that, it was very much an embarrassment for a public school team to lose to a parochial team. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you develop a high school as far as did you, you knew you were, you knew you, you were good, you eventually beat a man, or you just kind of, how did that all this just come about? Well, I always love the game. I mean, obviously, I always tell young people, you, you have one thing that you have to have no matter what you do in life, like you have for what you're doing, a passion. Mm -hmm. You have a passion to communicate information to people and tell stories, and it makes you feel good. It's what you love to do. Mm -hmm. Well, for me at that time, I loved the game of football. I loved it at the Irvington Colts, and I loved it at the next step at Seton Hall. Now, I played as a sophomore. I started as a sophomore, but... I, I, you know, it wasn't easy. I mean, there were guys there that were great players. I mean, yeah. it was Seton Hall, but I always had a desire and a passion to do a little more than most would. You know what okay. I mean? I always tell kids when people walk to the beach, I was running to the beach. When mm -hmm. people were getting out to go at night, I was running at night. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And you got to be willing to go a little further in everything that you do. If you want to achieve something great, I just listened to a great thing. Um, it was funny. We're doing this tonight. I listened to a great motivational thing. Uh, oh, uh, what's the actor? Um, uh, he played Malcolm X. Um, Denzel, Denzel, Denzel. I was just listening to a motivational thing from him. He said, you know something to achieve greatness, you have to be able to risk it all. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was great. You can't live life safe all the time. Sometimes you have to be able to, and you know, you, you got to do things out of the norm if you want to achieve something Absolutely. great. I was not a great athlete. I wasn't big. I wasn't, you know, I, I just, I felt maybe worked harder maybe than the next guy. And I wanted a little more. Mm -hmm. Now going into my senior year, I learned about the weight room and okay. I learned things, how to make myself a better athlete and all that. And I got bigger and stronger, you know, that by my, that year. And then obviously you could play at a place like Penn state, but you know, to, to me at, at Seton hall, it was a great competition day in and day out. It was a desire to want to achieve. I wanted to play at Penn State. I want that was my dream growing up. Okay. And you know, laugh at another dream. My other dream was to wear that Packer uniform one day. I was mm -hmm. a Lombardi fan. I'm an yeah. Italian American. Vince Lombardi was our yeah. hero. Jersey you know, guy. And that's it. I mean, he, you yeah. know, I wanted to play for Vince Lombardi. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's pretty much what my motivation was. Uh, interesting. And I know you talked about the team success you guys get rolling. Um, when you're there, like, what schools, obviously, did you play, you guys mostly played schools in Essex County uh, uh, back then? I'm just, yeah. I'm just curious. Well, we played, here, one was funny was, 
because you had Mike Lamberti on a week or so ago. That's right. And I and thank Mike for getting you. I the Belleville game. That. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the Belleville game was a woof. That was that got ugly. Mm -hmm. But uh, we played Belleville and um, who else? We Nutley. We played okay. Nutley one year. We played uh, who else from? As, remember back then it was independent. You had to try to find games where you could. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, who else did we play? We didn't play Irvington. We played another uh, Essex County school back West Orange, I think we played, or which was Mountain. And, um, you know, that was about it. You know, we mixed, it was mixed. We played Elizabeth, who back then was Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. Um, you know, so we played a mixed schedule. We played people from a lot of different counties. So, you know, you got to try to get games. No, absolutely now. Because even back then, correct me if I'm wrong, now this there was no state playoffs. It was just no that, that record at the end, and, and that was no. It. it came in right at that time. Okay, we were the first again. My my years were the first years of the Star Ledger playoffs. Okay, we played my, my again my my junior year. We won the Star Ledger Trophy. That mm -hmm. started the streak. We beat we beat believe it or not Queen of Peace, and then for the state title we beat I want to say Bergen Catholic. Okay. And then the following year, we won 11, 10 more in a row. We played Bergen Catholic and maybe Don Bosco. I can't, my God, but I'm getting old. Mm. I can't even remember. But my point was there was a playoff format then for at least, okay. you know, the parochials. There, they, you know, we did find out who the state champ was. And then I think we beat out New Providence mm -hmm. for the state title. Okay. Oh, a public school. Interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah for, for, and that was funny. Because, yeah, it was a public school. And, again, it was not done very often. I don't think it was ever done prior to that. Yeah. Now, you get um, – obviously, you mentioned Penn State. Was that um, – did you get any other offers? Or you just – was tunnel vision. You're going to Penn State. You'll go to these other visits just to go. But I'm going – I know I'm going to Penn State. That's a great question. Funny thing. Coming out of high school, I was the number four – number three ranked linebacker in the country. Mm -hmm. A guy named Bob Crable, who wound up playing for the Jets for a lot of years, and Jack Del Rio, who Jack we all Del know as a yeah. coach. Me, all three of us came out the same year. Jack Del Rio came out, obviously, you know, head coach in the NFL. And as we came out back then, again, things were different. You could only take five visits. Mm -hmm. You could only take five. And I wanted, to, obviously, I made it known as a junior, I was going to go to Penn State. I okay. made it known. I, it was clear. And the truth is I could have went anywhere in the country. I had mm -hmm. by, from anywhere in the country, but I, I made it clear that, you know, Penn state was, you know, my number one choice, but I still wanted to go to Wyoming. I was going to go to Miami. I was going to yeah. go to UCLA, which was my second choice okay. because I heard they were great trips. There were a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 No, the, <laughs> so the wife, the I wife snowed in on yeah, three yeah. of them, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I, I still wanted to go. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. I mean, I had, if it's free, they're paying for it. I'm going. <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, so um, obviously you get. I have to ask. This is probably this is one of my fan moments. Like, did uh, Coach Paterno come to your house? Well, again, that's a great, great story. I, I was the only guy in my recruiting class that he didn't come to. Really, I'm going to tell you a great story. I was the only guy because the night he was supposed to come to my home. One of our guys that we recruited, a tight end, Vito Cab out of DePaul, was not sure if he was going to make the move. So mm -hmm. they, in an emergency, they went down to his house and didn't come to mine. Now, part of that was he knew he had me. He knew he had me from my junior year. Okay. I made it clear I was going to be there. But it was something I never let Coach forget. And in the beginning <laughs> of my career, you're trying to play, you're trying to earn a name. Remember, everybody there is the best from where they come from. Yeah. So, you know, you're trying to fight your way through. Well, when I established myself um, as a player at Penn State, and then I became their captain, one day me and him had a conversation. I said to him, I said, you know, coach, you never came to my home. Yeah. I said, and you yeah. never came to my school. I said, it hurt. I want you to know that. I said, a mm -hmm. lot of time has gone by since then. I said, but it hurt. Um, I just thought it was something I always wanted to tell you. He said, mm -hmm. Chester, you know, I would have been there. I had to go to this kid's house, but beep, ba bop. Okay, no problem. I said, I just want you to know. Mm -hmm. To show you the kind of man he was. So my career goes on, and I'm very fortunate. I have a very successful yeah. career there. And very fortunate. And the draft comes. I get drafted. I go to Green Bay. My career pretty much is over. Now, I'm, I'm literally getting ready. I'm getting in condition at home to go to training camp. I'm at home. My career at Penn State's over. 
-hmm. I get a phone call. My mother gets a phone call. Okay. And it's Coach Paterno. And Joe uh -huh. says, Josie. Because back then, you know, she, he, my mother's name was Josephine, so he used to yes. call her Josie. Mm -hmm. Josie, what are you doing tonight? Nothing, Joe. What, are, what, what What's going on? He goes, me and Franny, Fran Gantner, who recruited me from here, he says, we're home. And, uh, we're, I mean, we're on the road, and we love to come over for dinner. Yeah. And my mother said, are you serious, Joe? And he goes, yeah, we'd really love it. So we, we as a family, we sat back, and we said, Look at this coach is going to make up for what he didn't come when I was being recruited. <laughs> right. I right. said, but it's all over now. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but I said, who do you want to invite over? Coach is going to come over. Who do you want to come over? And I invited one man, Tony Verducci, my high school coach. Mm. And it was one of the nicest evenings I ever had because you know why, Eben? There was no sell. He That's wasn't right. selling anything. Mm -hmm. It was over. I'd mm -hmm. been who I was and I had done at Penn State what I was going to do. And coach was himself that day. And I was very fortunate. I got to toast the three most important men in my life, my father, Coach Paterno, and mm -hmm. Coach Verducci. Nah, that's amazing. This is a great yeah. story. Your, yeah, brothers, your brothers didn't find their way to the house? Yeah. Oh, no, my brother did. Yeah, Mark got <laughs> there. Yeah, you know. And no, but it was quite, and it was funny was, yes. I'll tell you now that it's over, Coach is long gone. Him and my father drank a lot of wine down in the basement. He went yeah. down with his eyes open. He came up with his <laughs> eyes shut. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nah, to your point, there was no cell, nothing. It was no just No cell. Him. It was just him. Yeah. It was just him. Yeah. Just an old Italian man with another old Italian man drinking wine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Now, yeah. what, uh, back even with the Penn State, as far as this, when you got on campus, different world from West Orange. I'm, I'm sure. Like, how was that adjustment for you? Just Wait. socially, everything. Like, just oh, how you know what it is? It? It's so big. That's right. That yeah. You meet new people every day. Even to the day I left as a senior, you felt like you're always meeting somebody new. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you obviously you get adapt to it. You you know, you know your places. You know where you're going. You right. you, you know the people you're going to go see. You know, you learn the campus. But obviously, and that's the beauty of it. But there was something that made Penn State wonderful. And like I had said to you early. I could have went anywhere in the country and a mm -hmm. lot of, and there are things in my career that I've done that I wish I could have done different. There were things that financially, maybe I should have went to Canada. I should have mm -hmm. went to for a year, whatever, a thousand things. But if I had to live my life again, Penn state is where I would have gone. Yeah. And I'll tell you why he recruited good people. Coach Paterno believed in that. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys say it even, but they don't believe it. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you another story. And this is incredible. Coach Paterno believed we all should have our degrees. If you, if you were not going to go to school, you were not going to be at Penn State. That mm -hmm. was no sell. It was no jive. It was no lie. He believed in that. He loved that our graduation was up over 90%. All the men that I played with are successful businessmen today. But I'm mm -hmm. going to tell you how serious he was. And this is, this is great for a podcast. I'm at the Dapper Dan Classic in Pittsburgh. I'm speaking mm -hmm. on behalf of college football. It's my oh. senior year. And it's a big thing in Pittsburgh, thousand people, right. you know, I'm a, I'm a senior all American, you know, Paul Vecchio is going to be there and Dan Marino is going to be there from Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all going to talk and, you know, the people ask questions like we are. And then we're in the VIP room before the, 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 the date. And at that point, I just got an invite to go to the East West Shrine game and the Japan ball back then there was a game in Japan. Yeah, I remember, I remember that. Yeah. Remember that? And I wanted to play in both. I wanted to play in both. I needed to. I felt my draft status. If I could have good games in those all-star games, have a big game against Southern Cal in the Fiesta Bowl, have a mm -hmm. big East-West Shrine game, and then a big Japan Bowl, my stock will go up and it'll help right. my draft. Back then at Penn State, we were on trimesters, not semesters, three trimesters. Mm -hmm. To do this, I would have had to withdraw from the last semester, which would have left me one semester short of my degree. I went up to coach in the VIP. I said, coach, please, I promise you, I will get, I will go back to school and I will get it. I will finish. Mm -hmm. Chet, you know how I feel about this. I really, I said, coach, please, I need it. I mm -hmm. promise you. He goes, he looked at me like this. He goes, are you a man of your word? Mm -hmm. I said, yes, coach. He goes, all right, go. So I withdraw from the school the last semester. And I was on the road for almost a month between the Fiesta Bowl, East West Shrine game, going to Japan. I'm on the boat for almost a month. Come home, the draft happens, I get drafted, I got to go to mini camp, I'm back home now, I got the season comes, 
it's the off season of my first season at Green Bay. And there's a card in the mail. And my mother grabs it and goes, there's something here I think you should read. And I picked it up. And all it said was, I thought you were a man of your word, Joe. Mm. That's all it said. I wow. immediately, wow. I immediately entered school at Montclair State and finished my degree. The mid upon getting my degree, I sent a copy of it to coach. Mm -hmm. And he said, thank you. Good luck. Just like that. But imagine a year yeah. almost had gone Ooh, by. Yeah, that's heavy. Now, would that's you heavy. follow yeah. some guy yeah. that's graduated and gone? Mm -hmm. A card. It was hilarious. I have the card in the frame. Mm -hmm. I thought you were a man of your word, Joe. That's all it said. I knew what he meant. You didn't have to say yeah. it. Yeah, and I went back and finished my degree. Yeah, that's heavy. I mean, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he believed that he believed in it. A lot Absolutely. of guys say it, but he believed in it. No, nah, definitely, definitely. It didn't know. Um, it just playing as far as even at, at Penn State. I mean, obviously, you guys' success and everything else. You talk about the Fiesta Bowl. Just, just how was it? Again, like I said, this is national stage now. This is not, you know, what I mean, this is yeah. not New Jersey. Like, just, you know, um, obviously, just you talked about your, your level of commitment as far as for somebody to walk to the beach. You were the one running. That obviously didn't change when you got down. You know, uh, college got worse. Station and you got worse. Okay. Well, it, eventually, you know, it was funny. I attribute my I would not have been able to play at Penn State. And when I went there, I was maybe 205. Maybe I was 6'3". I, I appeared, I always said I had a Jack Lambert look. I looked Jack bigger Lambert. than I yeah. was. Mm -hmm. I was only about 205. And you're not going to play major college football back then. And the schedule we played at 205 mm -hmm. pounds. I had a man by the name of Dan Riley, who's our head strength coach. Do you remember when Nautilus first came out? Remember the Nautilus machines that came I know out of them, yeah. training? Yeah. We were the first team to use Nautilus. Mm -hmm. And I went from 205 to 230 in a year. Of, okay. And I mean, my neck was 22 inches wide. I mean, I, I was in shape like I'd never been in shape before in my life. And without Dan Riley, who went on to be the head strength coach of the Hogs, the Washington Redskins, mm -hmm. who Joe Theismann attributed their success in winning their Super Bowls years after to Dan Riley. Mm -hmm. Dan is was one of the greatest strength coaches I've ever been around. I've been around many. Um, and he, he, without him, I don't play at that level. That's the first thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing is there's something about that setting at Penn State. It sits on a hill and Beaver Stadium is up there. And it has, it, I always said it had wings. It looked like it could fly. It just had an awesome look to it. And off in the distance is the Nittany Mountains. And on a fall afternoon, the colors were just vibrant. They were just as beautiful as you could see. And all around the stadium were thousands of tailgaters and old folk. We used to laugh. A lot of our fan base were people that had been season ticket holders there for 50 years. Mm -hmm. They knew every Penn Stater that ever played. <laughs> and when we would walk out of the stadium, Chad, come and have a hamburger. And you would mm -hmm. go have one with them. They were just great people. Mm -hmm. And it was a, there was a feeling there. And in that moment, when you came out of that tunnel yeah. and you felt the ground shake, it was something special. No, it had to be. It had to be. I mean, back then, I mean, I'm not sure that the stadium expand as far as capacity. It was 90,000 back, back then. Now it's it over 90. 100. Yeah. Okay. 90,000. It was still big. Like yeah, I just, said, I played in front of bigger crowds in college than I ever did as a pro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Ohio yeah. State was over 100,000. You mm -hmm. know, I played in big stadiums in college. Packed. Packed. You know, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. But it was something. It was, uh, like I said, I have no regrets where I chose to go to college. None. Mm -hmm. None at all. Because they played independent schedule. Uh, yes. State. Yeah. We were, back then, if you remember, they had the, the Lambert Trophy. It was for Eastern Supremacy. Mm -hmm. And it was us, Rutgers, Syracuse, um, Boston College. College, okay. West Virginia, maybe, I think, might have been in that. Um, mm -hmm. And for sure, the ultimate rivalry, us and Pitt. I mean, yeah. people don't realize the intensity of that. It was, to me, it was the greatest rivalry in the country. People talk... You know, they talk Auburn, Alabama. They talk USC, UCLA. We took second fiddle to nobody. Mm -hmm. My senior year, when we Pitt was number one in the nation, and we went into Pittsburgh and we spanked them. We beat them 48-14 on national television. Yeah. On that field that day of 44 positions, there was 36 future NFL players and three wow. Hall of Famers. 
That's the talent that was on that field. Because as Marino was playing Marino for Marino was one of them. Play. And he right. was the quarterback. Then you had Jimbo Jim, Colvert. Jimbo, Jimbo oh, Colvert, my God. Yeah. You had Bill Fralick. You know I mean, you had, oh, Mike Munchak, who I wound up being an assistant for with the Titans. Mm-hmm. Uh, Munch and I have been friends for 40 years. Munch is yeah. a Hall of Famer. Mm-hmm. Um, you, uh, just the, uh, Mark May. Remember Mark May? Mark May, yes. 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 Uh, big tackle. Did he does a great job with ESPN. Mm-hmm. Um, the talent on that field was just Todd Blackledge, Kurt Warner. And yeah, you, Kurt you know Warner. Kurt Warner, but I, the Seahawks, yeah. yeah. Through my whole career, every time I would mention to a running back, man, you remind me of Kurt Warner. Coach, I ain't a quarterback. Man, oh, yeah. Man, don't anybody remember my time? <laughs> yeah, no. Nah. Yeah, career. Yeah. And I know it was cut a little short, too. I, like, yeah, yeah. 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 And how, you know, it happened. It was, it was a rough day. It was, um, it's the thing that hurt the most was you always wonder what if, you know what I mean? But I, you know, as you get older, your priorities change for yeah. many years. And I went through a bad time. I was depressed uh, when my career, yeah. I was running down on a kickoff in New England and wasn't even supposed to play. Mm-hmm. I and Ray made the team. It was the last preseason game, but the guy that they were going to cut got hurt. So my coach leaned over his Chet, there's one more kickoff. Can you go down? I went down on this kickoff and I got a clear shot. I don't know if you remember a guy named Stanley Morgan. He yeah, was a receiver. wide receiver. Yes. And I had a nice beat on him. I had a nice lane and I was going to get him inside the 20. And my foot got caught in the turf and I just heard it go boom. I mean, I felt it. Yeah. Um, and for all intents and purposes, my career probably should have ended that way, that, that moment. Because we didn't have the surgeries we have today. The whole mm-hmm. concept of the way they do the surgery is different today. Within a day, I was in a, on the operating table. Today it would be a month before they'd even do the surgery to rehab the support muscles. Mm-hmm. But meanwhile, that was the that was the surgery of the day. So I go in, and I never forget. I was half in a grog in the hospital, and the phone rings because they're doing they're looking to see how bad it is. And the, Bart Starr, who was my coach of the Green Bay Packers at the time, must have called mm-hmm. the uh, called the operating room. And I remember the doctor and I'm half in a, like, I'm like this. And the, I hear the doctor go, no, nah, Bart, he's done. Oh, I just, my, in yeah. my sleep, I went, oh, oh. you know, yeah. Bart, he's done. Yeah. And for that, I think they invited me back the next year more as a courtesy because I was a draft pick. But I'll tell you what, I worked my rear end off and I came back and that was, that meant a lot to me. I did. I wasn't going to leave the game that way. Nobody was going to carry me off in my last. Absolutely, game. that Absolutely. wasn't going to happen. And I came back that next year and I made the team again, and mm-hmm. to their surprise, also. And you know, mm-hmm. it was. And then I blew it out again against Dallas on Thanksgiving. Now, how about that one? Here I am on Dallas, yeah. and I draw a guy, and I was so excited that day. We're playing, and there's a guy named Bill Bates. You remember him with the Cowboys? Yeah, he was yeah. Like safety, a special team safety. Guru. Yeah, yeah. And you and want to my play coach safety, said, yeah. Chet, you got him this week. He's yours. And I was excited. I was ready to go. Opening kickoff, the same thing happened again. Yeah. And now I'm realizing, again, nationally televised game, and I know my whole family's at home. And this, was happen- this happened in Dallas, and my whole family's home watching the game. Mm-hmm. They picked me up, carried me off. And the first thing I said when I got in the locker room, I got to call my mother. <laughs> Right, right, right. I call my mother and I hear, oh, God, she's crying. I said, Mom, all right, yeah, I'm all right. Yeah, yeah. Go eat the dinner. <laughs> that pretty much was it from there. I tried one more time with the Jets, but, you know, I had a good mini camp with them and I had to go for surgery again. The meniscus went. And at that time, I said, that's it. It's done. And he also, mm-hmm. I mean, I've come to the conclusion where as hard as it was, there was a bunch of young kids that saved my life. I always said this. I get a phone call from Frank Verducci. Remember the Barringer coach? No, nah, I've been talking to him. Trying to see if I could get him. I've been there talking to him, coach. I've been talking to him. Frank calls me up, and he's at Governor Livingston at the time. He was the mm-hmm. head coach there up at Berkeley Heights. Mm-hmm. And he says, Chet, I know you're home. Can you come here and help me out? And I, you know, I said, uh, all right, I'll give it a shot. I went up. Okay. And I fell in love with those 29 kids yeah. coaching the game of football. Mm-hmm. And I always said, and a lot of them, when I mean, Vin Crisafi wound up being the mayor of the town, Mark Stallone's the sergeant of police. Many years later, they all have kids. And I always told them, you guys saved my life because I found out what my calling was then. I had tried Wall Street. I lasted two weeks really? there. You know, did. Okay. For me. I got to smell the dirt. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I decided to, those kids 
And I fell in love with coaching at that moment. And I fell in love with, I, I got more satisfaction out of watching somebody do something they didn't believe they could do because of what you taught them than mm -hmm. doing it myself. And that's, yeah. that's when you know you're ready to make the transition. Yeah, no, nah, interesting you say that because I know sometimes with coaches and those who have been very successful as players, that's tough. That's a tough, yeah. I mean, if they can't do it as good or better than you, it's kind of, yeah, that's a, that's tough. Oh, they coaches. always say, Whitey, which McCall couldn't understand, Sandy Colfax couldn't, or not, was it, uh, one of those great pitchers couldn't understand why you can't see the, the, wet, the, 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 the things on the ball to hit it. Well, mm -hmm. I'm not you. I can't, <laughs> right. I don't, if I was you, I'd be in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And sometimes, but you know something, I think for me, having gone through tough times and faced some adversity, I think maybe it humbled me a bit to a point where, oh, don't get me wrong. My first year in Bloomfield, that was my first coaching job. After mm. I was the defense coordinator for that one year at GL. And then once okay. I realized I loved it, I decided I want to be a head coach. Well, there was mm -hmm. a job available, Bloomfield High School. Mm -hmm. And nobody wanted that job. Why? They were in the midst of a 30-game losing streak. Yeah. And I knew nobody wanted it, so I figured I got a chance for it. I had a good playing resume, so I'm going to give it a shot. I go in, put my name in, and for whatever reason, I get the job. Now, what year was that? This was 1986. 86. Yep. And I go in, and the streak's at 30 at the time. Mm -hmm. And we start. I start training camp. Boom, working with these kids. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I was watching kids that fundamentally literally couldn't defend themselves on a football field. Mm -hmm. uh, no skill development, no strength development, nothing. The season started. We were getting assassinated. We were getting blown out by everybody. Mm -hmm. And I was... Sort of, I have to be honest, Ivan, an immature child. Okay. I was banging, pounding my hands, stamping my feet. Can't believe it. How could the guys that play for me act this way? How could this happen to me? I've never lost at anything. And then what happens is you realize you better grow up and you better face the problem and address the problem right. or it's going to eat you up or you'll never accomplish anything. Mm -hmm. So I decided, you know, some, it is what it is. Let's go to work. And I found a nucleus of young men, one you know very well, Jermaine Johnson at Belleville. Right. And I took Jermaine at that time. Jermaine was a freshman. Fred Valise who wound up playing right. at Penn State. Penn State. State. With Penn State. Freddie right. was at Penn State. Great group of kids. Nikki Diorsi. I took these four kids and we started in the weight room. We went and got that Nautilus equipment because I knew Nautilus training. I knew it worked from my days at Penn State. <laughs> we went to work. We yeah. received actually national acclaim for our conditioning program at, at Bloomfield mm -hmm. High School. We go to work, things starts, we're working our butt off, the streak had hit 40. Kids, let me tell you how bad it was, Ib, and this should never happen. I had kids that were afraid to wear their varsity jackets to other events because they got abused. Yeah, because you know, yeah, back then it was, you know, absolutely. you go to the mall, you go to the mall with your jacket. Yeah, yeah. You, get tear, you get torn up. Yeah. They wouldn't go to a wrestling match. I remember Belleville, our arch enemies in wrestling. Yeah, yeah. They wouldn't go to a wrestling match with their jackets on. They didn't want to get abused. So now you got a lot to overcome. You know, the fact of low self-esteem, physicality, uh, skill development, you got a lot to overcome. I ran a football camp there. I brought in a lot of NFL guys that I played with mm -hmm. in the summer, teach fundamentals, fundamentals. And I wound up running that camp for over 20 years. We go to work. Opening day comes the following year. We lose, but we play hard. We lost a tough hack and sack team, but I could sense it's starting to change. Yes. The streak's at 41. All of a sudden, the next game, we're playing Paramus Catholic, a parochial at, mm -hmm. which we call, at um, Bloomfield. At Foley. And we beat them 7 nothing. We score with three minutes to go in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. We hit a seam pass to Freddie Valise in the seam. Lorenzo Sozio, who's a great softball coach there at a Montclair Immaculate or some one of those, mm -hmm. was my quarterback. And they mobbed the field. They tore down the goalposts. People were crying. Yeah. Brothers who had played for Bloomfield that never won a game were holding their brothers and crying mm -hmm. because they finally, the streak was broke. And then a funny thing happens to young people. Like losing becomes a habit. So does winning. Absolutely. And the next week we go to Paramus and we beat them. And the next week we go to Don Bosco and we beat them. Mm -hmm. Then we went, we finished the season four and five, but I got everybody coming back. coming back. Yes. We go to work and we go to work and we go to season next year. We're nine and we're eight. No going into Nutley. 
We lose a heartbreaker to Nutley. We had a great team back in that year. It's eight and one. And we're going, I never forget, Coach Rotino was my roommate at Penn State. I took my kids to Penn State for football camp. And Coach mm -hmm. Lou says to me as we're leaving, he goes, gee, Chet, I would be nice if we saw you in the playoffs. I said, yeah, that would be, <laughs> Coach. But I'm thinking in the back of my mind, he really don't believe that. Mm -hmm. So what are the odds that we made the playoffs? Guess who we bumped? Union. Union. They didn't. We beat Teaneck. We bumped Union. And they were our first round game is against the number one team in the nation, Elizabeth High School. Elizabeth. They were number one in USA today. So here you were, Bloomfield kids. At one time, you were the worst team in New Jersey history. And in two years, you're playing the number one team in the country for the state title. And we lost 19-10. And anybody that was at that game knows we gave them everything they wanted. Yeah. And that was, I always said, that Bloomfield experience would have been a great movie. It would have been a good movie. Absolutely. And you think about it, a couple of things. One, Bloomfield was was a hidden gem, and you kind of brought that gem out and let it shine. You figured group four, big town. Yeah, big school. Just, yeah, big town. So the players wasn't going to be an issue. And to your point, you turn around, you get that that first W, and like I said, one is contagious. It contained that spirit and everything, that whole atmosphere. And then um, and the, the other guy, I remember when I spoke to you, like you had Majet that year. Oh, Majet was yeah. Majette, Majette yeah. was a great. Went up, Majette went on to have a great career at UMass. At UMass, yeah. Um, he graduated UMass. I, Majette was the only one that didn't come to our. We had a, a which McCall, what's it call when you all get back together? A, a reunion, reunion yes. of that '89 team. And um, Majette didn't show. I was really looking forward to seeing Majette, but he was a great running back. Combination of speed and power. But you know what was more important about that group? to see the men that they all became afterwards yes, yes. to see, you know, people always, again, you spew certain things and we all know the cliches and say the things that we think are right, but do you really mean it? Does football change lives? You know, are you in the business to make young people better? Mm -hmm. And the only way you find that out is what they become to as men. And every guy on that team, Mark Gatos owes a million dollar company in New York. Majette Tynes is a, is a, is a vice president of some company. Mm -hmm. Tom, Steve Jardim owns his own furniture business. Right down the line, Tommy Johnston is an attorney. Mm -hmm. And those are the moments that you realize. And sometimes I, one of those things I always said, Paterno had a great cliche. And I tried to, I tried to live my life that way. Coach always said when asked what his best teams were, he said, my best teams were the people that were viable and productive in society. People mm -hmm. that went on to more than just football. Yeah. And as I got older, at 61, I'm not the same guy I was at 31. When yeah. I was 31, all I could think about was winning. That's mm -hmm. all that mattered to me. I wanted to win, win, win. I couldn't conceive losing. I still had a player's mentality. But now at 61 and sitting here doing something like this with you, with a chance to reflect, I think back to the lives that you affected over Absolutely. 30 years. You know, the men that went on to do great things, Al Shaman Singleton from Irvington, went on to play in the NFL, won a Super Bowl in Tampa, but more important, Al Shaman graduated um, the school in Philadelphia, the um, Wharton Business School. Mm -hmm. I Absolutely. mean, it is off season, he went to Wharton and he yeah. was told that he couldn't get the SAT minimum back then. And he graduated the Wharton Business School. I mean, those are the things you look at in their lives. You say, hey, maybe maybe I had a little something to do with that. And that's worth one lifetime. You know what I mean? And there's a, I got a whole list of guys like that that have gone on. A lot of them are coaches now. I, you know, a lot of Jermaine, you know, a lot of great coaches that I've had, you know, played for me that are doing a fabulous job. So I take more pride in that now than I ever did when I was younger. Oh, totally, totally. I mean, you look back and reflect. I mean, that's, that's growth. That's just the growth of you and what have you, I mean, if, if you was the person, men. yeah, they're good if, daddies, they're totally, good fathers, totally. you know what I mean? And they've been through tough times. So they know, I, I like to believe going through what we've been through, you've learned how to handle it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And you, you, you draw that analogy to your life and you go on with that. And I really mean that at, at this age. Now I reflect on the men they've become where I'm at right now, Passaic Valley. The mayor mm -hmm. of Woodland Park is an ex-player. The, the athletic director, Joe Benvenuti, ex-player. The board attorney, Ray Redden, ex-player. All mm -hmm. guys have played. But the other side of that coin is, you know, and I tell young coaches this all the time. If you think you're going to make every kid happy and you think you're going to affect every life positive, 
then you're going to be a very sad man when you go home every night. Mm-hmm. There, I have a number of kids through all my years that have passed away. I, yes. I think when I looked at my career, I think over, tw- I think 12 guys I've lost mm-hmm. for different reasons. And right. I feel sometimes, could I have done something? Could I have reached them? Maybe if I would have done this, could I have done this to help them? But, you know, you, you, you just can't save everybody. You know I mean? It's right. hard. Right. No, absolutely. And I know um, the late Muhammad Ali, to your point with the um, 31 and being 61, I'm going to mess up the quote a tad bit, but it's basically just like, you know, uh, if you're 30, if you're 50 years old and it's 20 and you're thinking like you're 20 years old, you just wasted 30 years of your life, you know? Yep. So, and like I said, I'm spinning it around a little bit, but you get the But point. that fits. Yeah, it fits. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it fits. Totally. You know, I mean? and, uh, so you, that powerhouse, that, that power eye you run in that Bloomfield, you get the coach. <laughs> yeah. So you get that turn, obviously, with Elizabeth, because that was Malik yeah. Jackson and all of them. No, uh, I, that, that, that was, was, that was, was the team we played. Had played Malik, against, played Hamratty, against Malik Jackson, right? That's what I'm at. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. So do you we think had him, we had yeah, him? We yeah. had him. We fumbled on the floor. We had him. I don't want to look at still. Yeah, yeah, I want to. Oh, yeah. Man, we had him. <laughs> <laughs> that, so do you think about, um, staying there or is it time to make a move or like what? Well, like for me right now, you know, I'm enjoying my grandchildren. Oh, no, talk about back then as far as at, that Bloomfield, like was it time for you to? Oh, yeah. Oh, else? no, no. I had realized that, you know, and this is another thing you have to be honest with yourself as a coach. When you're a demanding coach and you ask a lot of your players and you're one of those guys that put, and I learned this from Dick Vermeil, there comes a time you have to realize they're not hearing it anymore. Right. For whatever reason, because you push so hard, sometimes it's just, it just ends. Now, in the, in the, in the case of Bloomfield, you know what I mean? In the case of Bloomfield, I just always had a desire. I wanted to go to Irvington. That was a little okay. dream of mine. I wanted to, you know, mm-hmm. I just had a desire to go to Irvington. Okay. So, you know, I, I realized we went as far as we could at Bloomfield. Um, I had taken it as far as it could go. And I think that's, a, that's something as a coach, sometimes you have to realize when it's time to say goodbye. Right. You know what I mean? We had done great things. We've done things that, well, we're talking about them today, ain't we? You know what I mean? So we did some things that these kids have memories for the rest of their lives. I always told these kids, one thing I always wanted you to do if you played for me. Many years later, when things get tough and you got to pay bills and things look yeah. bad and you sit down with your friends and you're having a beer and you think back to coach and you think back to the season I want you to have a smile on your face. Mm-hmm. I want that to be something that nobody can take from you. Absolutely. And those moments and those time spaces and time are things that nobody could ever take from those kids. And that's mm-hmm. who are now men, but that's always something that meant something to me. So then I go to Irvington, I'm there two years, but then Alshamon Singleton is being recruited by Tulane. He's being recruited by Rutgers and mm-hmm. Temple. Well, Temple hires a coach, Ron Dickerson. Remember right. Ron? Right. Ron gets hired. And Ron's a Penn State guy. Mm-hmm. And Ron comes to Irvington to scout Al, to see Al. And he comes to a workout, a weight workout. We're down in the weight room, okay. and we're all working out. And he saw my kids, the way they hit the iron at Irvington, the way we just go in there and we go to work. And he was just so impressed with the kids' discipline, their demeanor in the weight room, how they handled the weight room. Um, just the, their whole – they were just great kids. Um he asked me, Chet, would you come to Temple? He said, I know coach, you know, you, you know me from Penn State. I know you line, you know linebackers as good as anybody. I said, mm-hmm. you know some Ron? How could I say no? I mean, I got a yeah. chance to go coach in the Big East, you know, okay. playing Virginia Tech, Boston College. Mm-hmm. It's an opportunity that comes. Um, I had a great assistant ready to take the job if I, you know, walked out. And me and Al Shaman went together. Okay. We left together. Al mm-hmm. signed there. I went with him. And we had a great four year. Uh, well, I, I only stayed two years. Um, mm-hmm. I just, let's just say I, I, the direction the program was going, it was time for me to walk out after two years. Al okay. finished a great four year career there. Don't get me wrong. It was a great place, a great school. I just didn't like the direction we were going. Um, okay. Things that were going on recruiting wise. I, I just didn't feel that committed to it anymore. I said mm-hmm. to my wife, it's time for us to go back home, go back to, to uh, North Jersey. And that's when I looked for a job. And that's where the first job at Passaic Valley, my first go around at Passaic Valley was. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be an incredible stay. Again, great kids. We had a great record. Uh, Kids, you know, like I said, I told you the resume of those kids today, 
they were all great kids. It was a great stay. Went from Passaic Valley, I stayed there five years. I left there to go to uh, Clifton. I was there five years. We did some great things at Clifton. I was proud of those kids. Mm -hmm. They really, and let me tell you something, we played a tough schedule. That's Hack good. and sack with all the, when they were loaded. Uh, Don Bosco had Ryan Grant. They were all loaded. You know, we played some loaded teams, man. We just, they're loaded for bear. And um, from there, I got the call from Elizabeth. And that was one you just can't turn down. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. They've been struggling and they shouldn't be. You know it and I know it. They That's shouldn't right. be. That's right. There's got to be kids here that can play. And we went there and um, it was it was a getting to know you time. They had to get to know me. Right. I had to get to know them. And I always said something. You don't ask for respect. You earn it. And one mm -hmm. of the things I always tell my kids when I first meet them, I'm going to ask you for nothing. I'm going to earn everything from you. Mm -hmm. And you're going to do the same for me. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, we could fight through anything. So I don't believe in asking for it. You got to earn it. Kids are not stupid. They know, you know, if you're full of crap or not. They know. Oh, no, they, they, got the, yeah, about. they got the best BS meters. Damn yeah. right, man. They Absolutely. know. It. And it was an interesting thing. There was one day I knew that I had reached them. I got the job in June. We're, we're, I only got a month and a half to get ready. And we're, we're pra I said, guys, we're going to have to sacrifice the weight room. We got to practice right away. Mm -hmm. Get on the field. We're practicing. Bring my staff in, fundamentals, evaluating the kids, who can do what. A beep, a bop. We do a couple seven-on-sevens. And we bring in St. Peter's Prep, okay. who had Will Hill, who mm -hmm. had all those guys. And we beat them 12 nothing, Not 12 points, 12 touchdowns to nothing. We, they couldn't deal with my kids in a seven on seven format if we played to today. That's how good we look back there. So my sister comes up and he goes, Coach, you know, we got something here, don't you? Yeah. I said, Unless I'm blind, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that. <laughs> I think we got something. But this, we need to discipline this group. You know, it right. can't just be about athleticism. But how I knew the kids were buying in, when I would go down to the field house at Elizabeth, I'd always go down early, go to my coach's room lay on the couch and put Sanford and son in. I love, I have my Sanford and son tapes and I put my Sanford and son in and I'd watch it an hour before practice. And I'd try to fall asleep catching that. Well, one day I got the tape in and this is before game week, the first opening day. And I'm closing my eyes and I hear talking in the room. Oh, come on, man. No, no, no. But, but and I, just, I lean over and 15 of my kids are in my office watching Sanford and son with me. Yeah. I knew that moment they bought in. We're going to be all right. Mm -hmm. And we wound up winning the state title. We wound up beating Phillipsburg at Rutgers. And honestly, in my opinion, that was the best football team in the state of New Jersey in 2006. A bunch of great kids. They What mm -hmm. they did accomplished in two and a half months was incredible. Yeah. To make nice. a run like that in that Absolutely. league, Linden, you know, schools like that, mm -hmm. um, the, all disagree. You know, I, I was, it was the most – I said to my brother at the end, I said, Mark, what do we do for an encore? Yeah. I mean, next year has to be a letdown. <laughs> it has to be. How could yeah. you beat this with these kids pulled off? Mm -hmm. And all you talk about great kids. My captain, Rick Tabor, wound up being a, um, uh, whatchamacallit, um, a, a sergeant ranger. Um, he, he was one of the rangers that held the first Democratic vote in Iraq. Mm -hmm. He's now a state trooper. We talk okay. about leaders. We talk about great guys. Absolutely. Afis Williams owns a business in Chicago. Um, you know, just, just a bunch of Ray Graham, Ray Graham wound up almost winning the Heisman. Mm -hmm. um, just a great bunch of kids. Basim Houdin, who wound up uh, going to Idaho state and playing a great career now coaches at Elizabeth. So just a bunch of great guys that went on to good things after the game. Yeah. Nah, nah. And again, it is, it speaks for itself. Like all the um, kids now, men that just go on and do stuff here. And it sounds like, to your point, your, your model is kind of like once that voice starts to get a little stale or dry, you make a move. So Time from Elizabeth, go. so Elizabeth, you stayed there how long? I was there five years. Five years, okay. Five years. And then um, then an interesting thing happened. I get a phone call from the Tennessee Titans. And uh, I was kind of, I couldn't, I didn't have, I, there wasn't really much thought. I got to go. Yeah. Um, and when my, my buddy got the head job, Mike Munchak was the head mm -hmm. job. We had coached together for many years through my football camps. Uh, Munch was the best offensive line coach in the National Football League for 15 years. Um, 
And he called me, he said, I think you can help me. I said, I'd love the truck. And we went down, went down to Nashville. We had a meeting and we wound up doing some great things together. I coached there for three years, um, started as special teams coach for two, mm -hmm. got promoted to linebackers. And uh, in our fourth year, you know, the NFL is a hard place. We went seven and nine and we're going to make a move. You know what I mean? Yes. And that's, yeah. you know, that's the NFL stands for not for long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. Nashville is a great city too. I got oh, it. My I wife, it, friend, my wife and I got a chance to hang out oh, there. Did you go down? Yeah, we've been down there. So great music anywhere you yeah, want. Nah, yeah, we had, we had, absolutely. How was that just as far as you went from high school to the pros? Like just to obviously you got grown men now that their livelihoods depend on it versus kids that you're molding to become men. Like how 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 was that? That's another great question, Ed, because you're gonna be shocked at the answer. I went there expecting to learn. I went mm -hmm. there expecting maybe they know something I don't. And what mm -hmm. you find out is that the game of football is the game of football, whether it's in the right. NFL or whether it's at the high school level, it's football. That's number one. Number two, I found that I had a better understanding of the players than most of the coaches did. Mm -hmm. They're 20, 21 year old kids with a big bank book now and a lot of money, but they're kids. Mm -hmm. They're still kids. And what happens to a lot of those older coaches in the NFL they get out of touch with what it is to be young, especially okay. young in the time of 2010. Yes. You know, and what happens is I'm fresh out of it. I've just been working with 18 and 19 year olds for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I know how to handle them. And you'd be shocked. I was getting calls from the GM, Chet, can you talk to so-and-so? Chet, can you go grab this guy? Can you grab him? He's, doing, he's acting up. He's getting caught at night. They were doing kids things. Okay. You know what I mean? They were doing, you know, maybe staying out late at night or doing nothing bad, just kid. They were kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously we had veteran players that were men, but uh, the majority of them are young. The draft picks are young kids. And I had a great rapport with them because I understood them. I understood what they were going through. I understood the issues of today. You know what I mean? What, you know, but you know, who's got a, who's got troubles at home, who, uh, who this, who that. So for me, it was a, a, a sort of a, wow. You know, I mean, I didn't expect to have this much say in some of these kids' lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other side was, again, you stand by what you believe in. I'm not going to ask you for respect. I had to earn it from them. They had That's to right. know that I knew what I was talking about. Hey, listen, the first day, I knew the first week they were going to try me. We're out there. I'm with the return men, all my returners, seven, eight guys were out there. And I knew there's two of them that with an attitude, older two mm -hmm. older guys that are going to try this rookie coach. I knew it. Mm -hmm. And I waited. And one of them came out late and I said, Griff, Michael Griffin, who wound up being a great player and a great guy. But Griff was going to try me. He didn't respect me. I'm a first year NFL coach. Mm -hmm. You don't know who I am from Adam. Griff's been in the league five, six years. He comes out late. I said, do me a favor, Michael, please don't come out to my drills late. I have X amount of time. I need you here. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. All right. Next day. Comes out late again. So I said, okay, here's what we're doing today. Michael, would you do me a favor? Can you go stand over there? And I ran the seven guys for 15 minutes. And I made them do gassers, which is 150 yards across the field, back and forth. Mm -hmm. But I made him watch. Yeah. And I said, every time he comes out late, you're going to run. That's called accountability. And I'll be damned if I'm going to run for somebody because they're lazy. Mm -hmm. Never Absolutely. again from that day on for three years did Michael Griffin ever come out to a practice league. Oh, and you have to earn your respect. You, know, you have to show him, I'm not kidding. You know what I mean? This is the way we do things here. This is the NFL. You're making a lot of money. You know what I mean? You know, and that, and that was the part, you know, you earn your respect. And, and then I, you know, as, a, as my career grew in the league, I, I got an opportunity to do a few great things, you know, on special teams. Matter of fact, on Google, you could look up a reverse that we ran when you're done here. You're like fooling around, put on, um, Tampa Bay, uh, Tennessee Titan TD, a uh, kickoff touch, kickoff touchdown return by Tom Campbell. Okay. It's an awesome, it's a reverse on a kickoff. Chris, yeah. It's awesome. We caught him. And you want to hear a kicker to that? Here's a kicker to that story. What's, yeah, what's that? We run a reverse and we, we beat him. We went up beating him. The head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at that time was a young man named Raheem Mars. Yeah, from Irvington. Who played yeah. for me at Irvington. Yeah. was one of my kids and he comes to munch at the end of the game when the two head coaches meet mm -hmm. he said 
tell me coach did it. He said, yep, your, your, your boy did it to you. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Said, your boy did it to you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was great. Nah, good, uh, good, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, and then you got the pros and ultimately you come back, you come back to high school. It was yeah. just, your heart was there as far as to just one, be back in New Jersey. To, and, and it was everything. hard. It, I'm not going to lie to you now that I'm, you know, I'm away from it now. Mm. It was hard. I, I, I think I BS myself in the believing oh, I'm ready to come back. You, you can't be in the show and then it's hard. Yeah, to come back. You yeah, know what I mean? You, you know, yeah. you've been in the show. Don't get me wrong. I coached my rear end off and we did some great things. Proud of my mm. kids. But I think there was something inside of me that just wasn't there anymore. Okay. I had to come to grips with it. You know what I mean? And, you know, I coached my rear end off because I owe it to my players and I would never cheat them and I wouldn't cheat myself. Mm-hmm. But I, if I, again, looking back, I don't know if my heart was ever a hundred percent back in it again. Cause I, you know, it's, that's a hard, that's a hard show to be in, man. And come back. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Like you just reached the pinnacle of coaching. Yeah, I mean, you know, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you somehow you make the transition back. I mean, yeah. And then, yeah, you make, you make it back and obviously you're in the schools as well. Um, teaching and just um, educating as well too so yeah and that's and that's you know like I said the older you get the more you realize the other side of things and it's yes. about what you can give kids to go on in their lives everything football wise it is short-lived it's just it's, mm-hmm. it's 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 a whisk and it's gone you know what I mean and and that's what you got to make these kids understand you know what I mean that boys this is a wonderful experience enjoy every moment of it and for the rest of your life over a beer it'll be a great thing to laugh about and, and every story is going to get bigger and better Mm-hmm. As with each year that goes by. Mm-hmm. But the bottom line is, what did you learn from the game? What did the game give you? And That's if they're right. better fathers, if they're out working and earning a living, then it gave them the fortitude to take on all challenges. And if that's if that we gave them, myself, my staff, if we gave them that, then we did our job. Yeah, and, and actually, you know, I learned um, the same from one of my old coaches. You engrave your name in the kids, you live forever. In the hearts that's of right. kids, you live forever. That's so, right. You know, I see, yeah. it's a, it was always a funny line. And you remember that movie with uh, Troy, with Brad Pitt about the Trojan yes. War, remember? And his mother tells him, she goes, you know, you could not, you won't, if you don't go to Troy, you'll live a life and your children will love you and their children maybe will remember you. But if you go to Troy, you're going to live forever. Mm-hmm. But you're going to have to die like Achilles died at Troy. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. But you have a decision to make. Well, in our case, a little different. You know what I mean? Do, if you want to be remembered, you know, I mean, long after you're gone, you might not have a lot of money. I might not have a lot of things. But if 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 20 years from now, one of them gives you a thought, then that was it was it wasn't wasted. It no. wasn't wasted. Absolutely. What is sports giving you? That's that's stuck with you to this day. What is it giving you? Well, again, for me, it obviously gave me an insight into people. I mean, okay. there's nothing there's nothing better as a player looking across in someone's eyes. The eyes tell you a lot, you know, you know when yes. things are hot, when things are cold, when things aren't going well, how did you handle it? Um, you know, the word quit, you like to believe, never, never enters your mind, although there are times it does. Um, you know, there are so many adversarial things that go on during the course of a career that you have to overcome mm-hmm. as a coach. Again, overcoming my old, my own childish belief that not that winning is everything, but that's the only thing. And that just happens with years of growing up. And that, and, and that's the biggest change that came over me. I, like I said, I look back, I look back as a player I don't apologize for anything I did on the field. I played a mean, hard, nasty game. Mm-hmm. And I lived life hard. I yes. like to, I, I, I never half did anything. My wife gets on me all the time. You don't know how to half do anything. If I put salt <laughs> on a burger, it's too much salt. You know what I mean? I've not, my whole life, I've never half done anything. I mm-hmm. had prostate surgery and, and a hernia surgery uh, a month ago, both. And I'm already jogging. I don't, yes. I'm not going out that way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You got to go out yes. on your feet. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And that's the way I wanted to live my life. And as a coach, I wanted to affect people. If my kids never quit, if they know how to handle adversity, they don't give into it. You know, you get knocked down, you either get up like a lion or you lay down like a lamb. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And that's what life is about. It doesn't suffer fools. You can't, 
You can't, you know, tiptoe around it. You got to meet it head on, like on a football field. There's nowhere to hide. You embrace it and you take it on. And if they do that, then they've done, they've learned well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, like I said, I'm very gracious of your time, coach. Uh, thank you. This was great. You, Evan. Thank you. I'm not gonna let you off the hook. If you get a few more minutes with me, is that, is that cool? Go ahead. Cool. 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 Actually a few questions here before we head out here. I'll have some fun here a little bit. What, um, when you're driving, uh, New Jersey, the Parkway or the Turnpike? Parkway. Parkway, okay. Yeah. okay. It's probably even better now because the tolls are gone. Absolutely. Oh, I'm it? old school. Got to go on the Turnpike, man. Got I go to huh? You said Parkway. 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 Turn Parkway. Okay. Oh Parkway. yeah. I got to go to my Long Branch exit. I go to the <laughs> swim slide there. I go down my Lang City exit. Hit the casino. Okay. <laughs> nah, good stuff. Parkway. I don't like the Turnpike. Favorite place to eat. Nona's in Farm Park. Okay. How's that? Not quick enough? Nona's yes. in Farm Park. Tremendous Italian food. I'll take you one day. Okay, absolutely. Absolutely. What, uh, as far as a, a night out, where, where are you going? If you need a beer or just... Jane R. Tobacco. I go have a cigar and a scotch. Okay, now where, now, <laughs> now, where, now where's that at? Right on Whip, right on Route 10 in Whippany. And I'll right take you there, 10. too. Right, right on Route 10. All okay. my buddies, okay. that's our spot. It's the okay. only place you can smoke a cigar and not get yelled at. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, get a little tough here. You got uh, Seton Hall or Penn State? Ooh, that was tough. Oh, that, that, ooh, you got me. On, um, I loved Penn State. Yes. Penn okay. State. Yeah, my my dearest friends in my life are from Penn State. Um, we still stay in touch to this day. We've buried each other's families. Um, mm -hmm. We've buried each other's mother. You know, we've we've stayed close for 40, 45 years. Yeah, it's yeah. it's Penn State. Where was you at when you got the the call from the Green Bay Packers? Great question. I was sitting in my. You want to hear something funny real quick? Sure. I'm sitting in my room. I'm sitting in my apartment, and at Penn State. Okay. My wife who became my wife at that time, she's only my girlfriend. We're sitting in my apartment and I was supposed to go in the fourth round mm -hmm. to the Philadelphia Eagles. Okay. And I'm what back then, if you remember on ESPN, they only showed the first two rounds. Remember they didn't do it like they do it. Now you see all the rounds and all this nonsense back then it was new. It was only two rounds. So now we're keeping the ticket. There's a way to find out, you know, as the draft is going. Okay. And the fourth round comes and they take a linebacker, the Eagles from Ohio state. And I'm slamming the table. I'm crying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm literally yeah. crying. I'm crying. And my wife goes, just relax. Now the fifth round comes and I don't get picked. Mm -hmm. Everything I worked for, my God, why me? What happened? What happened? Sixth round starts. The phone rings. There's a woman's voice. And a girl goes, hello, Chad. And I said, who the hell is this? Hmm. And he goes, Chad, my name is Barbara. I said, don't call here, man. You know, she goes, no, 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 honey. I think you want this phone call. Coach hmm. Bart Starr would like to talk to you. And yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'd like to welcome you to the Green Bay Packers. My eyes were crying. I almost yeah. hung up. I said, no, no, honey, don't hang up. Don't hang yeah, up. No, yeah. Glad you did. Yeah. And then we all went down to, the, to the, the local bar in Penn State that we all used to go to. Okay. And all the draft, remember, 13 guys got drafted from that team. Mm -hmm. And we're all there. And all of us, all the draft picks, huh? celebrating. Nah, Great nice. night. The greatest night of our lives. The culmination of a lot of work. Oh, totally, totally. That's good stuff. Good stuff. Speaking of games, best game you ever played in your life on any level? Any level. College, Southern Cal in the Fiesta Bowl. Matter of fact, it was funny. I just was fortunate. They came out this year. It was funny. I just caught it. It's funny you asked that. Mm -hmm. They just came out, the 50 greatest players and coaches from the Fiesta Bowl over the first 50 years. Okay. And I was named to that team. And I took a lot of pride in that. Absolutely. I played in two right, Fiesta yeah. Bowls. I played against Ohio State and I played against Southern Cal. And in both cases, we won against two great players, Arch Schleister and obviously um, uh, Marcus Allen. I don't know how that slipped my name. My wife had to yeah. hit me. Marcus mm -hmm. Allen. And you play against, and I had 
16 tackles against Southern Cal, 15 of them against him. And, yeah. um, you know, at that time, he had never been held under 100 yards in a single game, and we held him to 87 yards on 25 carries. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. That was, that was, I think, my best game I ever played. Special, special. Yeah. Best, best game you ever coached? Ooh. Um, Elizabeth in the scene, Elizabeth against Phillipsburg. It, the, the Elizabeth season, the Elizabeth season was, it was unprecedented. It, to do what they did, to do what they did in, it's from, in literally two months to win the state title and really be the number one. We finished number two in the state behind a parochial, but mm -hmm. we, we were number one. We, nobody would have beaten us at that point. We were just getting better and better. We were scary good. Mm -hmm. um, they, that was, I never saw kids absorb as much football. Let's put it this way. We had trouble flipping the tight end and adjusting the defensive front at Temple, but we did it no problem at Elizabeth. Yeah. Words, mm -hmm. If you trade the tight end, you got you to you flip the front because now the strength changed. So when mm -hmm. you set your front, when the tight end flips, everybody's got to kick back the other way. Your Sam becomes the will. Your three technique becomes the nose. Everything has, and it takes a little time. We mm -hmm. never could get it at Temple, but mm -hmm. we got it at Elizabeth. Got no Elizabeth. Problem. They, now, our football acumen at Elizabeth was incredible. Sounds like it. Totally. I always said like the difference in my Elizabeth kids and every other place I ever coached. If the ball was on the ground anywhere else I coached, they just jump on it. But at Elizabeth, they're scooping and going. They're running off with it, mm -hmm. and that was the difference. They had great acumen. They understood the game. Mm -hmm. no, no, good stuff. Now, uh, I know coaching schemes and plays change throughout the years. Is there one play or anything that's that you might have still do a little wrinkle in? You, you, you've kept from day one well, as a know, coach, like a favorite play or something? You know, it's funny. The game itself now is so, again, you could see how the draft has changed. You could yes. see now where when me and you were young, what running backs were the prime people in the draft. You know, you got a great running back. He, now running backs don't even go to the second round mm -hmm. because the game is all about throwing the football. It's all about wide receivers. It's all about DBs and quarterbacks. Um, the game has changed, but I still believe this and I always will. Why is it that every team that winds up winning it can run the football? Yeah. Because the bottom line is who blocks and tackles the best. And from the day I left high school football, mm -hmm. we power the football. I make no bones about what I do. Because if I can win the line of scrimmage, I take your heart. And if I got your heart, I got you. Absolutely. And that's Absolutely. what I believe in. And that the game is that simple. You mm -hmm. find all these guys that watch a little too much TV. Mm -hmm. And I tell Pop Warner guys all the time, stop. I don't want to see three and four wide receivers in a Pop Warner game. If you can learn to run a dive to the fullback, you've come a million miles. Mm -hmm. Just teach those offensive linemen how to come off the football. Right. Teach kids how to tackle properly. You do that as a Pop Warner coach, you've done your job. Stop mm -hmm. with watching TV and trying to do these things. You can't run a simple dive play. How are you going to run RPOs? And, and, I, and, and you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's my biggest thing as far as coaching and style of football. You know, yeah. we, we've come to a point now where it's, it, it, you know, the game has gone five wides, empty sets. It's played in nickel. It's played in dime. Mm -hmm. You rarely see three linebackers on the field. Fullbacks right. are right. out of work. Full, yes. There are no fullbacks in the league anymore. You know, and I miss it. I miss mm -hmm. that part of the game. And yet you watch the Tennessee Titans. They run the ball down your throat with the big fella back there. Right. They're going to run the ball. You watch Green Bay. Green Bay can run the football. I know Aaron Rodgers, a great quarterback, but they can run the football. That's right. That's right. The good team still can run the football. They mm -hmm. still respect it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Here's one uh, for you. Uh, who's better, uh, Chet Polivecchio, the player, or Chet Polivecchio, the coach? That's a good question. That's a great question. That's a that's your wow. I think Chet Polivecchio, the the coach. Because it's not about me. It's about other people. And I'd rather be remembered for helping other people be better players than myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think definitely the coach. The coach. I think I, I found out who I was. I always said that day when I finally realized my career was over, and then those kids at GL, what we talked about earlier, 
Yeah. They made me realize that God meant me to go in this direction. God did that to me for a reason. Chet, mm -hmm. I need you to coach young people. And I believe that. I believe that was for a reason. Yeah. Now, good stuff. Now, someone who should have made it, and I know made it is a blanket statement, but I would just say maybe in college or even to the pro level. High school? High school or just somebody in general. I mean, just somebody that I played with. Played with or just heard about or been around. Who? Oh, absolutely. Ray, my, my, well, he did make, Raymond, again, got hurt. Yeah. Ray Graham could have been an all-time great. Ray mm -hmm. Graham could have been, Ray Graham was the greatest running back I've seen since Kurt Warner. Ray Graham did things on a high school football field that I, I've never seen a kid do since. Okay. His ability to change direction. Now, he went on to Pitt, and he had an incredible career at Pitt. He's, mm -hmm. I think, the third all-time leading rusher. And when you look at Pitt's running backs, Tony Dorsey, Curtis uh, Martin. The guy for the Jets. Who was the guy for the Jets? Curtis Martin. Curtis Martin. When you yeah. look at all those guys, pretty, pretty good crew there. Mm -hmm. um, Ray Graham should have been great. Ray Graham should have been a great player in the league for a long time. Ray Graham was Kurt Warner. And Kurt Warner was the best. And I played against all of them. I played against Roger Craig. Mm -hmm. I played against I Am Hip. I played against every great running back you could think of. In my era, there were great backs. Yeah. Uh, Tony Nathan, Major Ogilvy. You go down. I mean, there were great backs. Um, Kurt Warner was the best running back that I have ever seen on a football field. His ability to change direction at full speed was uncanny. Mm -hmm. And Ray Graham had that same ability. There was yeah. nothing Ray Graham couldn't do on a football field. I'll tell you how fun, how, how, to what point. We had no punter that year we won the state title. We had no punter. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I said, okay, we got no punter. But I got Ray Graham. And what we're going to do in, in, our, in, the, in the next scrimmage before the season starts, during punt drill, I'm going to make Raymond punt. And we're, he's just going to take off. He's going to catch it and make everybody miss. And no one will rush the punter again. You mark my words. Raymond catches it, takes off, goes right down the sideline. Yeah, yeah. No one touches him. <laughs> Ibn, I swear to you, we didn't see a punt rush for 13 games because they wow. all knew Ray Graham was back there. Mm -hmm. He was out of fear. Mm -hmm. A defensive back, when I was at Penn State, we, I used to take my players to Penn State every year for okay. yeah, fundamentals. They run a great football camp. So I took my Elizabeth team there. Everyone in the country knew Ray Graham as a running back. Ray Graham put on a show as a corner where literally 900 campers stopped, wow. circled the field, mm -hmm. and the 15 wide receiver recruits that Penn State had at that camp, Raymond iced every one of them. Mm. The place was going nuts. Tom Bradley, who at the time was defense coordinator at Penn State, who's now with the Pittsburgh Steelers, Scrap was a teammate of mine. He goes, Chet, are you kidding me? I said, what are you doing? Well, at that time, Raymond didn't have the academics. We were waiting on a series of tests. And Paterno had gotten burned by another kid they waited on and never got it. Mm -hmm. And they lost him. So Joe was adamant to his coaches. I want these kids to have their academic requirements now. Mm -hmm. And Scrap went in there and said, because I wanted Raymond to go to Penn State. Yes. And Joe wouldn't offer him. So, okay. Wichmacall had no problem. Wanstad had no problem at Pitt. So we yeah. went to Pitt, and he wound up haunting him. So that's good. Mm -hmm. But Raymond, there was nothing Ray Graham couldn't do on a Ray football Graham. Yeah. He was the most talented player that I've ever coached and ever seen in high school. Wow. Wow, yeah. sound, he sounds special. He sounds yeah, very he was special. Like I said, I've I've seen a lot. You know That's right. I mean? That's for you to say he that. Was right there, and it blew his knee out. I remember, Ibn, I was having a beer in Nashville. I was going home from practice. I stopped to have a beer, and I'm watching ESPN the Thursday night game, and they're playing South Florida. Mm -hmm. And Raymond was in his senior year. He was a Heisman Trophy finalist, one of the guys up for the Heisman, and he blew his knee out, and I was <laughs> crying at the bar. Mm. And he was, I saw him on TV, he was crying. And it was always amazing to me that he went that long without blowing his knee out. Because mm -hmm. the cuts he would make, you wonder how the human body could handle those change of directions. And I'll never forget it. My head, right, Gene, my head went down and I just sat at the bar 
tears come down my eyes. And Ray G was out and he, he never recovered from it. He got, he signed with Houston, the Texans. It wasn't the Ray G anymore. Yeah. It was that he didn't have that confidence to in his legs anymore. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Nah, nah. Sound sad. like it. Nah. Yeah, it was sad. That's you know, that's the heartbreak of it. Nah, but he's nah, doing yeah, well. He's a postmaster now. He, he's a postmaster, not in Elizabeth. He lives, I forget where he lives, but he's a postmaster now. Okay. Yeah, nah, good stuff. Doing great. A couple more and I'll and I'll leave you alone, yeah. I promise. Um as far as what's your best, your best sports sports moment. Best sports, oh great one. Oh, best sports movie. Oh, no, sports oh, moment. Sports, movie buff. sports moment. Sports moment. Oh, sports moment. Oh, for without you. a doubt. The, I don't think it, it can be. It never did more for a country than that moment. The kids in the Olympics beating Russia in the, in the mm -hmm. hockey. The hockey. The 80, That's to me 80, the greatest 80, moment yes. in sports history. Mm -hmm. Unequivocal. I don't think there's anything that meant more to this country than mm -hmm. at that time, the cold, you know, all the stuff that was going yes. on with Russia and you know, a team that had just beaten them 14 and 12, nothing the week before mm -hmm. to come back and live. The best, um, the best analogy of that victory was um, by the guy that used to do wire world of sports, Tim. Uh, not Al Michaels, Al Michaels. Not Al Michaels, the other guy. Yeah, no, Al Michaels, you're right. Okay. He said, this is the equivalent of a high school team beating the Pittsburgh Steelers. He <laughs> said, what you just witnessed today. And I just thought it did so much for all of us. You know what I mean? And it's, and it's funny was it wasn't a mainstream sport. It wasn't a sport like basketball, football, baseball. It was the fourth of the majors. Right. For them, those kids who really nobody knew who they were, mm -hmm. for them to rise all our spirits Absolutely. up. Absolutely. That was just a great moment in sport. Absolutely. And since you brought it up, sports movie. Sports movie. There's a moment in a movie. I, I'm a I'm a huge I'm a huge movie fan. My mother was when she was living, and I'm a big film noir, 1940s, 50s murder mystery guy. I watch Turner classics all the time. But sports moments, I always love the moments in sporting movies. I think the one with Robert Redford, um, The Natural, is God. Natural. Okay. That moment when, and there's a moment maybe because it hits home with me. That moment when he's coming in from left field and we realized early in the movie what a pitcher he was going to be. He was going to be one of the greatest of all time. And then that, he got in that accident where the girl shot him and he went into anonymity for a long time and he comes back and he's just an old man trying to make it in the league. And in that one moment when he comes back and he, he makes the team and he's, he becomes a star, but he don't pitch anymore. But no one on the team knows that he ever pitched. And his friends said, come on, Roy, throw one in, throw one in. And for that split moment, he went on that mound and he thought back to his pitching days. And they didn't, no one there knew he was a pitcher. And he threw the ball so hard, it went through the net. Mm -hmm. And you hear the music beautifully and all the players just stopped and stared at him. And you realize at that moment, how great he would have been and how it was taken from him. Yes. And there's nothing worse than knowing how great you could have been and having something take it away. That's, mm -hmm. that's, and that, I just love that moment. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I love that moment. And I think that's the beauty of sports movies. Hoosiers is right there. I mean, who, how could you, you know, Hoosiers is there. I mean, they're great. great the movies are great. Nah, tons of them. And that speaks volumes here. Now, nah, and I'll leave you with this, uh, um, as far as the action, what's the best part of, about being Chet Palavecchio? Today, being a grandfather, okay, making sure my grandchildren, you know, my my grandchildren are taken care of. They're raised the right way. They understand the way life is about. And the best part of Chet Parlbecker, hopefully, will be some memories that he was fortunate enough to leave a lot of young men in their lives, a lot of great moments, a lot of things that nobody. Because one thing great about athletics, in a crazy world that we're in. Nobody could ever take that from you. Yeah. Athletics is a life unto himself. And, the, and, mm -hmm. the, and the, the playing field is something that's not subject to the whims of, of, of the world. It's ours. It's, it's the athletes. It's our place. And nobody could take that from you. And it's pure. And that's what I think is great about it. I think all those moments that kids were able to feel, feel success, feel defeat, mm -hmm. the pain of defeat, understanding it, not giving into it. 
the glory of victory, all those things, that's my greatest memory. And like I said, I appreciate it with every year of my life that goes by now, you appreciate it more and more. Absolutely. And in that part, as far as um, the Chet Paul Vecchio now, what advice would you give that senior at Senior Hall Prep? What advice would you give him? Live your dream, man. Chase Absolutely. your dream. Absolutely. Don't You know, Coach P lives by three things. I played great football because I owed it to my teammates. I played great football because my owner paid me money and I had respect in myself as an mm -hmm. athlete to play great football. And I played great football for the most important reason of the three, for all those people that said I couldn't. Mm -hmm. See, don't ever let people tell you what you can't do. And that was my greatest motivation. Too many people told me I would never make it. And that wasn't going to happen. Not on my watch. It wasn't going to happen. Nah, this has been great coaching. I just wanted to say one, you know, um, just to sit here with you, is just, it's just an honor and privilege. I mean, oh, I know you have you, ac accolades, you. Ac accolades through the roof here, thanks, you know, man. whether as a player, as a coach, you know, what have you. And just to just hear about you just in my travels here, I mean, it was just, like I said, for me to even uh, be sitting here, I'm just like, oh, thanks, it's taken away, take, just taken back by all of this. Like I said, I'm, like I told you when we first got on, like I'm, I'm a fan first before anything else here. And like I said, you know, while um, yourself and just what you've done and just even hearing your stories here and obviously everything's always turned back to as far as the kids and them being better off because that's when it's all said and done what we want as far as those kids transition to adulthood or what have you here but I'm extremely just humbled by you just taking time oh, out Andrew, I know you, you had I, I know you I know you got you I know you got no, your no, real thank you very much I thoroughly enjoyed this this was a ball this, yes. you know why because everybody needs to remember where they come from now and then and every you got, got to reflect on on good times and bad but you, totally. you, you do a very, very necessary thing with your podcast. And I wish you all the luck in the world. And if you ever need anything from me again, please feel free to call me. No, absolutely, Coach. And uh, tell your wife, I know she's I, I hear in the background. Yeah, so. wait, no, 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 no. Her hair looks terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, let's not get us both in trouble. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, yeah, yeah. let's not get us in trouble through your hair. Yeah. No, no, but Thanks, send my best to her. And be God well. bless you. Be God well to everybody. God Thank bless you, you, buddy. Take care. That was great. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, totally just um, just excited and humble, just kind of just catching up. Like I said, people that I've seen, heard, read about, whatever the case may be here, like I said, Coach Paul Vecchio, he's one of them. Like I said, extraordinary career, extraordinary life. You know, um, ain't much more I can say to that. With all that being said, I put my hand over my heart. That means I feel you. 